When I was a, when I was a kid, um, I, I, was, I was a good kid, yeah, but there were, there were certain things that I, I, I always wanted to, uh, I, I was always led into temptation to sin. And one of those temptations that I had that I never went through on was when I would walk home from school, and our, our elementary school wasn't too far, and even our middle school, um, like we would drive home, and on the way home, whether it was walking or in a car, on report card day, I would always have the temptation to kind of change the grades a little bit. Um, you know, like I, I was always afraid of, of having to sit at the dinner table and tell my dad, like, oh, by the way, I didn't get perfect grades. You know, like I was always afraid because I was always afraid that, um, I don't know, the world was going to end. And so, and so for me, grades were really stressful, and, and they still are. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, grades were really stressful because I, I, I knew, I knew if I, if I went, if I went and I to explain, like, my grades weren't perfect, that it was bad news. It wasn't good news. It wasn't, it, I don't know. I had, I had friends in school that they were like, man, they were so stoked because they were like, I got a B. And they were so happy. And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, in my family, a B is an F. Like, you don't, you don't get it. And they're like, what are you talking about? Your parents should be stoked. Like, you're, you're, getting, like, you're getting A's. And I'm like, no, but like, I'm stressed because this report card, I have an A minus. And like, I have to go home and I have to, I have to tell my, my, my parents and, and they're going to be so disappointed and they're going to be so sad. And so like, I would have that temptation of changing the A minus to an A plus. You know, just a single line and then you'll be, you'll be able to, to change it over. And, and that, was, that was going through my heart. And, and interestingly enough, as much as I dreaded it, you know, I would go home and I would tell my mom first. I'll be like, okay, mom, I didn't get only A's. I got a few A minus. I got an A minus. And she would be like, okay, we got to make sure we, we, you know, we cook the best dinner. We set everything up correctly so that when you tell your dad, like, he's in a good mood, he'll just be like, oh, it's okay, son. And it's ironic because, like, I, I would go through all this stuff and I would tell my dad, and you know, my dad's cool. Like, he was like, he's like, just try harder next time. And I'll be like, I'll be like crying. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. He's like, just, just try harder. Just do better next time. And it's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm such a failure. He's like, no, no, don't worry. You're not. And, and it's funny because there's a flip side to this. Like, as much as I dreaded telling them, them bad news, when I did do well, like, you know, when that report card was straight A's, when I would ace the test, when I was top of my class, I would go home and I would tell them, I'm like, mom, dad, guess what? I'm number one. And I would like, I would brag and I would say like, oh, I owned it. I killed it. And the funny thing is this. When I told them that, they'd be like, hey, calm down. You know, like your head's getting a little big. Like it doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like this is what I, I'm working so hard to do. Like I'm, 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 I'm doing well. Like can't you... Oh, can't you just like be happy? And, and, and that was kind of like the funny thing is when there's bad news, I'm afraid of the punishment. When there's good news, I kind of get the, like your egos, your ego needs to be checked. Like, you know, just, just kind of calm down. Ironically or interestingly, this is what I actually my experience with evangelism is like. Th this is what, how I grew up regarding evangelism, that there's kind of two camps when it comes to sharing the message of Christ, sharing about the gospel. It's either you come to it with this dread that it's just like, oh, I know it's my responsibility as a believer that I have to share my faith. And so I'll just go to people and be like, oh, Jesus, he loves you. He cares about you, but you're a sinner. And you're going to hell. And it, you know, it really is. It's that, it's that like you dread it. You're like, I know I believe in this. I know I need to share it. But it's just like I don't want to. And oh. And on the flip side, there are some people that you know, that I know, that are on the streets. And they're like, Jesus is the best. And they're like, you need to follow Jesus. And they're super passionate, super excited. And it's funny because I think with both camps, I, I, I have issues. I think with both camps, I, I have an issue because on the negative side, it's like you should be a little happier sharing about the gospel. And on the side where they're crazy, it's like, whoa, calm down. Like you're getting too crazy. And I remember in college, there were guys like this. They were, they were the ones that they were, they were there with the sign saying like, you're going to go to hell because you're a sinner. And they're, they're the ones that are saying like, if you don't believe in Jesus, you know, you're damned forever. And it's like, bro, you got to calm down. Like, I know you're real zealous about the message and you're, you really want to share about Jesus, but you're coming across so intense, you need to bring it down a little bit. 
I think there's a better way. And I, I, I think we can get to a point where evangelism is no longer that bad word in the church. Where when, when someone tells you, hey, you need to share your faith, that we don't have these emotions of like, oh, this is the last thing that I want to do, that there's no way I want to share my faith. And I hope it's not the other way where it's like, you're ready to, to grab your signs and go out downtown and be like, you're all going to hell. Like, I hope neither of those sides is what we aim for. I, I think there's a better understanding. And I find this balance in the story of John the Baptist. And I know I've already preached about John the Baptist, but I'm going to do it again. And I apologize, but at the same time, I'm not sorry. Because I love the story of John the Baptist. And so whether you're looking on the screen behind me or, or open up your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. And what I love and love and love about John the Baptist is because this guy is real. He is genuine. He is not living a life out of obligation or by the constructs of society. He's not worried about what people see and what we'll even see in the characterization of him. He really didn't care what people thought of him. But at the end of the day, his message brings some insight. And So Matthew chapter 3, starting from verse 1, we're going to read the first 12 verses. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And, he, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and will clear and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. All right. That's pretty tough. And, and what I love about John the Baptist is this dude spoke truth. He, he spoke it in a way that was genuine and real. Even the way he looked, he was wearing camel's hair, a belt, he ate locust and wild honey, which it's kind of funny because now I think about his diet and I'm like, that's pretty paleo. You know, he's probably like hip. He's, he's like cool because he's eating, he's eating from the land. He's wearing, he's wearing this, this clothes that doesn't really matter to the people. Like they're, they're thinking, that's yeah, weird. He's wearing camel's hair. He's wearing this leather belt. He's eating these, these, these bugs and, and he's out in the wilderness. He's out in the desert. He's not in the middle of the city. And, and the way John the Baptist's ministry is going is it's, it's relatively simple. His message is this, is that repent, for the kingdom of the Lord is here and the Messiah is coming, so repent. That's it. It's as simple as that. And through this simple message of just repent, of repent, for the kingdom of the Lord is near, for the Messiah is coming, led hundreds of people to come to him. And this is where he began to baptize them. He began to, to baptize them, explaining, your, your old life is gone, and now you are brought into new life through the Lord, through God. But one is coming that is even more powerful than I am. You know, people were, were trying to put him up on a pedestal, being like, oh, John the Baptist, have you heard him speak? Have you been to his, his seminars? Like, wow, they're amazing. John the Baptist's whole point was, hey, hey, guys, I know you like this and we're, we're making a lot of big crowds, but there's a guy who's coming after me. 
who's way better. See, like, I'm baptizing you with water, but there's a guy who's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's a guy coming after me who's going to baptize you with fire. Like, you think that I can change your life, but John the Baptist explains, he's like, no, this Jesus, the Messiah who's to come, he's going to change your life. And so John the Baptist is going in this ministry, and, and, and what naturally happens when you become popular, what naturally happens when, when an amazing speaker comes into a place and, and, and people start to come in droves, is you have Pharisees and Sadducees come. And, and when we read the word Pharisees and Sadducees, I'm not going to go too depth about what it means, but essentially, these are the people that, that are, are in the temple. These are the, the ones that are adhering to God's law, that they know, they know the Torah backwards and forwards. In many ways, they memorized a, a lot of them, the higher-ups. They memorized the whole Torah. They memorized the whole first five books of the Bible. They, they knew it backwards and forwards. They knew all the laws. These were the guys that lived in the temple. I mean, not lived there, but they were there every single day. They were there all the time in the community. And the funny thing is, is many times in the church, when we hear about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what we do immediately is like, okay, they're the bad guys. Those guys in the story, whenever you read about the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're the bad ones. And Jesus and his disciples are the good ones. So it's like the bad guys and the good guys. And, and, and the, what I love about that, even that statement, is that when it comes to culture and when it comes to the way we act and operate as church people, as people that come to church every single week, as people that grew up in the church, as people that have family that went to church, is that we are closer to the Pharisees and the Sadducees in our daily lives, in our culture, than we are to the disciples of Jesus. And so we have to be very careful before we just say they're bad guys, and we have to come to a point of understanding of how they're thinking. See, I, 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 let me put it this way. If I was a Pharisee during this time, and I, I was in the temple, and all of a sudden all these people inside the synagogue were, were, were starting to say, they were like, hey, have you heard about this guy, John the Baptist? He's out in the wilderness, and he's talking about God. And he's talking about things in the Old Testament of God's prophecies and how they're becoming fulfilled today in our time. And these Pharisees and Sadducees, before you're thinking they're like evil and they're just like, oh, we're going to kill John the Baptist, you have to understand, their first reaction is probably thinking, okay, we need to go hear what this guy has to say. So let's go and make a day trip of it. Let's go travel out into the wilderness and hear what this guy has to say. So again, I don't think they're, they're, they're necessarily the villains just yet. They probably get into John the Baptist's midst, hear him preach, hear him talk about the need for repentance. And this is where I think the, the shift begins in the Pharisees' heart. Because I think the Pharisees hear the message of repentance and they're like, absolutely, they need to repent. Absolutely. Those people that are here, the homeless, the, the, the drug addicts, the, what, the fornicators, absolutely, they need to repent. You're right, John. What a great sermon. What a great message. And I think John began to sense this. John began to hear kind of the, the little murmurs and the whispers in the crowd amongst the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he's like, no, 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 no. You're the brood of vipers. You're the ones that I'm talking to right now. You're the ones that need to understand that you need to repent. And I, I'm, I, I assure you, this is where the Pharisees are like, what? What are you talking about? See, I, I always imagine, you know, what, what it would be like if we could bring one of these Old Testament characters, these New Testament characters um, from way back, the biblical characters, into our congregation today. How amazing it would be if, you know, in our church, in, at LCC, we were able to invite John the Baptist to come and preach. It's like, oh yeah, John's a buddy of mine and he's going to come preach for us today. And if he started his sermon by saying, LCC, you are a brood of vipers. Like, I'll be like, oh no, John. What a terrible message. You're like, no, oh, please. Everyone's going to leave the church. Everyone's going to, going to run away. But this is what John is doing to the religious people. To the people that have grown up in, in the temple. He's telling them, that what they're doing, they're doing is crazy. See, he, he explains it. The only reason why you're here is because you know that there's future wrath and you just want to save yourself from the wrath of God. Who told you to come here? 
What you need to start doing is start to do start to be doing good works because as a believer, as someone who says you know God, you are bearing absolutely no fruit. And he already beats them to the punch. He, sa- he, he knows that what they're going to say is this, but we're the children of Abraham. We're the chosen people. So how can you tell us what to do? We are going to be saved by God no matter what. And this is where I begin to hear the echoes of the church over and over again. All right. When we talk about John the Baptist's ministry, I think it's super genuine. I think it's real. But I think at one end, we need to apply it to ourselves first. I think we need to understand what he's getting at here. And the way in which he talks is very simple. It's very simple. If we, if, and again, boiling down John the Baptist's message is easy. It's repent because there's someone who's coming that's better than me. See, the Pharisees, their problem with this, their problem with this message was they really didn't believe someone better was coming. At the end of the day, they thought, I'm the best. I'm the one that's doing everything that I'm supposed to do. So it's not listen and do good works so that we can follow Jesus. It's, hey, you better fall in line and follow me. John the Baptist, MO, his, his, his common theme is that his ministry was based on rolling out the red carpet for Jesus. That was all he did. It was beautiful ministry. It was beautiful because it was simple. His goal, and, and even what he explained in the Old Testament, uh, even what Matthew explains in the Old Testament, is that there was prophesied that someone would come and make the path straight for the coming of the Lord. John, John probably read this prophecy in, in the past, and he probably realized and came to that moment where the Holy Spirit comes to him and explains to him, John, this is your calling. Your calling is to make the path ready for the Lord, that you would roll out the red carpet for Jesus. And let me explain to you, John the Baptist did a great, great job. He did an amazing job by making his whole ministry solely centered around saying, Jesus, Welcome. This is your kingdom. This is your place. See, John the Baptist was what understood his role that he wasn't he wasn't the main event. He was the intro. He was he's the guy that says, "And now welcoming the main event, Jesus Christ." The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're the ones who are saying, "No, I'm the main event." You came here to listen to me. You came here to to come worship in this place. This is the main event. And ironically, I see this in the church happen all the time. When people start to think, this is it. This is why you're here. This is the show. John the Baptist made it very clear. No, 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 no. I'm not the show. I'm not the one you came to listen to. I'm not the one that you came to follow. But the one who's coming has more power than I am. And honestly, I do not even have the ability to carry his sandals. I am not worthy to carry this man's sandals because he is God. He is, he is the Messiah. He's the one that I'm, I'm here for. John the Baptist's ministry was not a, a, a marking scheme to get himself popular in the desert, in the wilderness, to amass a big crowd that everyone would follow him. No, he was out there in the wilderness to set the way for Christ. But here's the interesting part. Not everyone's called to go out into the wilderness. See, I think people have read this about John the Baptist and say, okay, so therefore you need to go out into the wilderness and, and preach about Jesus at the far ends of the world. And I think that's a misunderstanding of it. God called John the Baptist to go out into the wilderness. What I mean by this is this. LCC, you are not called to go out into the wilderness that John the Baptist was called out to go into. You are not called to wear camel's hair and a leather belt and eat locusts and wild honey. That isn't the way in which we come about this. 
And the reason why I say this is because of this. There are so many times in the church I've, I've, I've seen evangelistic programs where it's people telling you how you need to share your faith. This is the 10 step way in which you share your faith and you spread the gospel. And you know what? I lived in this. I grew up in this. And I felt so much guilt of this. I remember when I was in high school and I went on a mission trip and I was leading someone to the Lord and I was, I was, I was helping them pray the sinner's prayer. And I don't know if you know what the sinner's prayer is, but it's a prayer of confession, repentance, uh, of relying on Christ. And it's funny because I didn't remember the prayer. And I felt so bad. Because as I was trying to lead this person to the Lord, I was like, oh, I forgot step two. And I was so stressed because of the, the protocols. Looking back, I realized it's not about the protocols. That all, my only job, my only calling is to simply just introduce Jesus. It's to, say, it's to roll out that red carpet. And just to say, hey, come and, come and meet, meet Jesus. And see, for John the Baptist, rolling out the red carpet meant that he went and lived in the wilderness and people came and heard the message of the Messiah. But for you and for me, rolling out the red carpet is a very individual calling. See, all of us have the same call. And, and, and every time people ask me, you know, how did you know you were called to be a pastor? How did you know you were uh, God's calling on your life? And let me make it very clear to you. The individual details are, is, is you have to go in prayer, and you have to have affirmation, and there's a step, on the, on, a way to understand your individual calling. But as a people, we all have the same calling. As, as a group of believers, we all have the same calling. And that calling is very simple. It's just to introduce Jesus to the world. See, when we introduce Jesus to the world, I guarantee you, you are fulfilling the God-given calling of your life. And you will begin to feel more satisfied with your life when you follow the calling of sharing the gospel with others, of sharing Christ with others, of introducing Jesus to others. But let me explain. From my perspective, the way that I, I accomplish this introduction to people, to Christ, is through preaching. But for you, it may be through giving. For some of you, it may be through service. For some of you, it may be literally because you are a parent to your children. And your calling is not to introduce Jesus to the whole world, but your, your calling is to introduce Christ to your children. You see, we all have a calling. We all have the same calling, but the way in which it manifests. For some people, for, for some people, their whole calling is simply just to share Christ, to introduce Christ to their spouse. For some people, it's to go on missions. For some people, it's to be in the work environment, in the workplace, and demonstrate and introduce Christ to your coworkers and to the world through your business. But again, we're not called to the same arena, but we're called to the same goal and same vision. And at the end of the day, the temptation that comes is that instead of fulfilling our goal of saying, and now welcoming Jesus Christ, what we end up doing is we say, oh, now welcoming me. Look at my life. Try to emulate all the things that I've done in my life and follow my, my teachings. Follow my example, my footsteps. I've seen pastors do this many times. And it's not to say that they're wrong. I'm just saying that there's a greater example more than someone speaking on a pulpit. Trust me, don't follow me. Follow Jesus. And the interesting thing about this is when John was saying this message to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I know what the correct response would have been. Instead of them being hard-hearted and... and, and <laughs> going back to the temple saying, oh, John's a terrible pre preacher and he's preaching heresy. If they went back to the temple as the leaders of the temple and said, okay, guys, John the Baptist is right. The Messiah is coming and we need to begin to prepare for his arrival. And if the temple was then 
transformed by turning its focus away from all of the other things and just saying our whole necessity, our whole purpose as a temple is to usher in the Messiah. I think the Pharisees would have found the truth of Christ. And we see this. And I'll talk about this next week because this is a two-part sermon series. This next week is Palm Sunday. It's a Sunday before Jesus enters into Jerusalem. It's a Sunday that Jesus enters into, this, into, into Jerusalem a week before he's crucified. And the interesting thing is this. The temple, in that sense, does exactly what they were called to do. They have their palm branches laying down on the floor, and as Jesus, the Messiah, Messiah enters into the city, they say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And what I'm saying is this, is that even these people understood naturally what you're supposed to do when you encounter Christ. You lay down the red carpet. You lay down the palm branches. You say, welcome, Jesus. You are the main event. See, John the Baptist understood this. I hope that we understand this. In every aspect of your life, your calling is not to be good. Your calling is to roll out that red carpet. The way we roll out the red carpet is by good works. It's by doing good things. Because that carpet is expensive. It's costly. And so when we do good works, it's not that your good works save you. It's that your good works are your way of saying, Jesus, you are important. You are worth it. And so I'm doing these good works because I want you to be welcomed in. I want you to be introduced in a well way. In a way that's honoring unto you. And so yes, I will do good works. The best way I can explain all of this is like this. When I, when I started dating Grace, my wife, I wanted, her, I wanted to introduce her to my parents. And let me tell you, I was scared. I, I, I was, I was, even though they met Grace before when we were friends, like I was scared because it's like going to my, my parents no longer as a little boy, but as a, as a man, being like, Mom, Dad, this is, you know, this is my girlfriend, and she's like going to... You know, I think, I think she's my future wife. Like, I think, you know, this is gonna, this is gonna be a big deal. And so I was nervous. I was, I was, I had all those, like, you know, I had all those uh, hypothetical situations. Like, what if my dad says this? What if my mom does this? Like, what, how am I gonna maneuver through all these things? But at the end of the day, I did it not because I had to, but because I, I wanted to introduce my parents to Grace. I didn't have a script. There was no protocol. There was no sense of obligation. I think when it comes to introducing Christ to our friends and our family, to strangers on the street, it really isn't about the message you have. But it's the, the fact that you're introducing a person, someone who's very important to you. My parents told me something that was very important. They were like, son, whoever you bring home, Whoever you bring home, we're going to love them because we love you. And I, I think that still sticks with me when it comes to evangelism. I think many times when we have relationships with people that matter to us, even if they don't want to believe in Jesus, even if they don't want to accept him into their lives, and again, this is where there's no obligation or, or there's, no, there's, there's no protocol with this, but I think many times what we fail to understand is that the people that God is calling us to reach out, they would love you regardless. See, I think there's the, the fear that comes into us is, is, is we, we say, oh my goodness, if I invite my friend to Easter service, they're going to think I'm a Bible-thumping Christian and that I'm, I'm super judgmental and they're going to break relationship with me. I think many times that fear is, un, is, 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 is misguided. I think many times the people that are close around to us, they know you're a Christian and they're literally just waiting for you to introduce them to Jesus because Jesus matters so much to you, or at least you say, it, you say he does. That Jesus matters so much to you and yet you're never going to introduce them to your friends. I had friends in college that they dated someone and we never met their girlfriend. And it's always funny because if you consider me a good friend and you don't introduce me to someone that you say is important, someone you say you love and you care about, then I'm going to say, no, no, you don't. You don't really love that person. You don't really care about that person because if you did, you would invite them to everything we do. 
you would invite them to every activity that we do as friends because you're crazy about them. See, I think what we've done with Jesus is that he's become, he's become kind of that embarrassing sibling. He's become that, 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 that person in our lives that we care about, we love, but ah, I don't want to take you out with me. I, I, don't want, I don't want to take you out into public because if I do, you're going to embarrass me in front of all my friends. Church, my call to you is this. Easter is approaching. My call is evangelism. Go, go, go share. Go spread the gospel. Go tell all of your family, your friends, your neighbors. Go tell the people around you, but not because you have a message to tell them, but because you want to introduce Jesus Christ the Savior of the world, that you would roll out your red carpet to them. You would roll it out by your good works, by the way that you live your life, by the fact that you've been setting up every moment to introduce them to Christ. And I guarantee you something. I guarantee, even if they don't come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and say, even if the Easter service is a failure because we don't have a hundred conversions, I guarantee you something, is that they will see your passion, your love for your Savior, and they will love you more. They will say, thank you for, intru- thank you for introducing me to someone that, that matters so much to you. See, I think we have this fear that if we bring to someone to church, that they either have to become Christian or we're just going to be like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm saying when, if we really say Jesus matters to us. We'll, we'll lay up that red carpet saying the Messiah is here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for, we thank you for Jesus. Father, I pray that you would give us a heart like John the Baptist that our mission would be very clear, our call would be very clear, that we are not here for man, but we are here because Jesus is here. Jesus is coming. Lord, we are here to lay out the red carpet for you and trying to prepare the way so that you would be ushered into your kingdom, Lord. Father, I pray that as we approach Easter that we would not forget the reason why we celebrate this day. That, Lord, you have saved us from the pits of hell. That you have saved us from our own sin and our own corruption. And, Lord, that you love us. You care about us. Father, I pray for this congregation, Lord, that you would help them to introduce your son to their friends and their family, their neighbors, their co-workers, their children. Father, they would not do it in a way with obligation, but they would do it with excitement and with love. Father, we love you, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, as we approach Easter, we have to understand that it's not about us. It's not about our church. It's not about how we look. That all of that doesn't really matter. That we could be wearing camel's hair and eating crazy bugs and still... What's important is that we introduce Christ, that we pave the way for him, that we roll out the red carpet for our Lord and Savior, that we not have the heart of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that simply believe in Christ so that they don't have to experience hell, that that's not the point of this, that the point is is that we have a Savior in Christ. The Holy Spirit is with us now, and that the Father loves us. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Father, I pray that even now you would be stirring in us to the people that need to be introduced to you, the ones that we love and are, are, are close with, that you would give us the courage. God, you would give us the courage to introduce your Son to them. Not because we're obligated, but because we love you and we love them. Father, I pray that you would teach us that evangelism is not about a script. It's not about telling people a certain set of words. But Lord, that it's about introducing your son. God, that it's about rolling out the red carpet for you. 
Father, I pray that you would clothe us in good works. Not that we are saved by good works, but Lord, that our good works would attract people to the cross. That our good deeds and our sacrifice would lead people to Jesus. Father, I pray that we would lay down our lives for this calling, for this cause. That you would begin to show us how we are able to lead people to you. And Father, you would give us a newness of life. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen.